Right, let's go ahead and have our prayer and we'll get started. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word. We ask you, Father, to please be with us as we study your word today and help us to see what your word is saying. Father, we know that your, your word, your Bible, is all the way down to the word, individual words within it. And that we can learn things, Father, looking at individual words that help us to understand your Bible, your word. Help us, Father, to see these things for what they truly are saying, for what you truly wanted us to know, Father, and help us to change our lives to meet your word, right down to the word. We love you. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Okay. Today's word that we're looking at. Good morning, Noah. Good to see you. Today's word that we're looking at is the word disciple. Uh, go with me, if you will, to the very end of the book of Matthew, the last three verses of the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This word disciple is, is one I, I don't think I'm, I'm saying a word that you've never heard before. Um, and for that matter, when, when you hear the word disciple, you may recognize a couple of things about it. But I imagine that we haven't given the word as deep a thought as often as we should. And perhaps for many people, they don't recognize the full significance of the use of this word. All right. Well, some people may look at this word and say, well, that's another word that Jesus Christ called his apostles. And they're right. Or, or actually the Gospels, which I guess Jesus Christ did too, but the Gospels, in fact, use the word disciple more often to speak of Jesus Christ's disciples, his apostles, than he ever did the word apostle, or the Gospels ever did the word apostle. All the way through the Gospels, that word disciple is used, and I believe there's a reason for that. And we're going to consider that reason this morning. Uh, good morning, Uncle Ross. Good to have you here. Um, but let's read these three words, this, these three verses at the end of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20, and then we'll discuss it, what Jesus Christ is telling them to do. Morning, Abraham. Okay, verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay, now notice what, what the apostles were to do. Their main purpose was to go out and, yes, well, yeah, I'm sorry. The very first thing Jesus says is make disciples. He explains how to do that in the following in the following words after that. But it's that idea of making disciples. You know, sometimes I think we get the cart before the horse. We want to go out there and save people, and then we want to make disciples. And Jesus Christ makes it clear that for someone to be saved, for for the for the process that he set up for someone to become a Christian, you must go out and make disciples. You must make people who are disciples. So there's the question. Could someone tell me what does the word disciple mean? If we're supposed to make them, let's figure out what they are. What's a disciple? I know what you always tell us. Okay. What, well, what's a the... What? of a teaching. Okay. I yeah. feel like a student. I like a student, yeah. Or I, or like you said, obviously I like it better because that's what I normally point out. The, the idea of a, a follower of a teaching. A disciple is one who follows a discipline. Okay, the, the, the word gives that indication. You have a discipline, you have a disciple. Well, that disciple is one who is following that discipline. For instance, let's say, let's say someone says, well, I'm a disciple of, uh, of, be, of vegetarianism. And they're, and they're standing there, you're talking to them at a restaurant, and they're sitting there eating a nice big steak. 
you know, covered uh, with, with a side of uh, of uh, bacon, uh, you know, on the side, uh, and and especially they say vegan, and then they, and they also have some eggs sitting there in front of them while they're eating that. You're having breakfast, steak, eggs, and bacon. Well, you're not a very good disciple of vegetarianism, and you're especially not of, of being of veganism. All right, all those things are against the discipline. All those things are things that you're not supposed to be doing if you are, if you are a disciple of that teaching, of that doctrine, of that if you're a follower of that way of eating, however you want to say that, okay? And, and that's the same idea uh, that we're seeing with the word disciple. Let me show you how this was used early, basically as Jesus Christ was coming on the scene. Go with me, if you will, to... Uh, Thought I had that. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have that one marked. Go to John chapter 3. I'm sorry, John chapter 1. I didn't have it marked because I, I knew I'd remember where it was, and then I had to think about where it was. Go with me to John chapter 1. And this is literally Jesus Christ coming on the scene. We're going to be looking down at verse 35, John chapter 1. Uh, let me give you the uh, context coming up to verse 35. All right. Uh, John the Baptist has been being questioned by some some men sent from Jerusalem. Okay, priests and Levites. You see, back in verse nineteen, were questioning John the Baptist, trying to find out who he was, who he was claiming to be. And then within their questions, they ask him if he's the Christ. Um, you know, they ask him a couple of different things. He he, he makes it clear that he is not the one. He, he may, most certainly makes it clear that he is not the Christ. And then the next day, look at verse 35, after all that questioning, look at verse 35. And the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. Now, notice that phrasing, whose disciples are these? Well, they're John's disciples. What, what had John been, kept, been sent to do? Well, John makes it clear in Matthew chapter 3 that he was sent to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. Okay, he was a voice in the wilderness crying out. He was crying out, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John was sent to prepare the way for Jesus. His disciples would be people who were accepting his message, who were accepting his teachings about the Messiah, and we're going to see in the text here, accepting his teachings of how important the Messiah was, how important this individual that God God was sending to them was. Now, remember, if you back up just a couple of verses from verse 35 in John 1, John says in verse 27, the one coming after me, his, his throng of his sandal, I am not worthy to untie. He's not worried to tie or untie his sandals. The lowest of jobs of the servants in a household was to take care of anything with the master's feet. Feet were considered filthy in that day, and there's a good reason they were filthy in that day. So he was saying, I'm not, I'm not even the lowest of servants, worthy to be the lowest of servants for Jesus Christ. All right. And so so when look at that again in verse 35. And the next day, John standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Look what his disciples do. The two disciples heard him speak. And they followed Jesus. Now they were good disciples of John. John was preparing the way for Jesus Christ. John was making making it clear that Jesus is the one we're waiting for. John was making it clear he's greater than me. So when you're a disciple of John, hearing the teachings of John, when John says, look, there's the Messiah, this is what you do. All right? Very good disciples of John. Keep going. Go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Again, John's disciples talking to him. Okay? Look at verse 25. Um, uh, the verses prior to that shows Jesus and his disciples baptizing, uh, baptizing people, going, going, came into the land of Judea and were baptizing people. Verse 22. But look at verse 25. Therefore, there arose a disciple, a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who, ha who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. 
John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses. And I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has, who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So the voice of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. All right. These men were almost, it sounds like they were either confused or I, I hope they weren't just a little bit jealous because they were John's disciples. They should know better. But whatever the situation is, or perhaps they were pointing out that Jesus is doing well. Hard to tell. But John's reaction is, this is exactly the way it should be. He is the one who should increase. I decrease. His only job is to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ had come. So now Jesus needed to be followed. His discipline, his teachings were going that direction. And so now Jesus is telling people to make disciples. Now go back to Matthew chapter 28. Jesus is telling his disciples to make his apostles, his disciples, to make disciples. Now were they to be disciples of his apostles or disciples of Jesus? Look at his words there following that. Let me read verse 19 and 20 again. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Now, the things that Jesus Christ taught, commanded his apostles, were his discipline, what, they, what made them disciples. They were to follow Christ's, they followed Christ's teachings. They were his disciples. He was giving them his teachings. They were his disciples. In fact, for three and a half years, up until the time Jesus Christ died on the cross, his apostles were learning from him. Now he's telling them, all the things you learned from me, you, all those things, teach them, teach others to observe the things that I commanded you. He's telling them, make disciples. They are disciples of Christ, not disciples of the apostles. All right. They are merely messengers. Like you and I have Bibles to read. We read those Bibles. That doesn't make us disciples of the authors of each one of those books. Uh, for instance, the Gospels that are, that, are, that are quoting the things that Jesus taught. That doesn't make us disciples of them. We become disciples of Christ. Those apostles were just living books, living uh, media to give the teachings of Jesus Christ. All right, so they were to make disciples. Now, with that idea, go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and look what was happening. Just like he told them to go and make disciples, teaching, uh, baptizing them and teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Look at what happens in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we see the first gospel sermon being preached, people coming to Christ, repenting and being baptized in verse 38, okay? And uh, let me start with verse uh, 40, following all that. The teachings of Jesus Christ, uh, then they ask, what shall we do? Uh, the teachings of Peter about Jesus Christ, then, they, then teaching about what should we do, about the fact that we helped in murdering the, the Christ, and, Jesus, and Peter tells them, repent and be baptized, each one of you, uh, in verse 40. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So, so then those who, were received, who received his word, they received it and believed it, were baptized. And that day they were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves. What would a disciple continually devote himself to? Look at what it says. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The very first thing mentioned there, the apostles' teaching. What was that teaching? Go back to Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. They became disciples. Now, that word disciple is what is what not only what the apostles were most often called, they're also most often what 
people who followed their teachings were called. We, do, we use the word Christian on a regular basis, and there's nothing wrong with that. But did you realize the word Christian is only used three times in the Bible? In fact, one of the times, go with me there, to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. In Acts chapter 11, verse 26, we see the word Christian for the first time. But look at who it is who are called Christians. Because this is what Christians are to be from the get-go. All right? Verse 26. Uh, verse, let's start verse 25 since it starts in the middle of a sentence in my translation. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now look, look what made them disciples again. Verse 26, the, right in the middle of it. And for an entire year, they met with the church. And taught them and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples, those are the ones being taught. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Throughout the Bible, the word disciple is used more often than most any word describing the church, individuals in the church. We are to be disciples of Christ. And that idea of being a disciple needs to be firmly locked into our heads. We, okay, so we, we discussed that word. We know now that that word means that we are to be, that we are to be following followers of a teaching, all right? And, and, and therefore, whatever that discipline is, all right, whatever that teaching is, is what we need to follow in order to be Christ's disciples. Well, how stringent should we be on following that teaching now, i just made my little joke or my little illustration at the very beginning about a vegan sitting down to eat uh eggs and steak and bacon would not be a very good vegan would he all right well take go with me to luke chapter 15 luke i'm sorry luke 14 luke chapter 14 Luke chapter 14. Slowly but surely, I'm changing the, 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 the uh, chapter numbers on the headings of my pages of my Bible. I hate it when they give the, the next chapter it's going to start as opposed to the chapter you're in when you turn the page. Anyway, that's a small thing. Uh, but What's that, Julie? Uh, I guess it's messing up again. I'm not hearing you. I'm seeing movement there. You can see me on Zoom? We're at Luke, we're at Luke chap. Again? What? Again? Luke chapter 14. Luke 14, verse 25. Luke 14, 25. Okay, I thought I was messing up again the way you're the, the way that was happening. Okay, Luke fourteen twenty five. We're going to see here within these verses. Um, we're going to see here within these verses what Jesus thinks about a disciple, because quite frankly, his opinion of what is a disciple is what's truly important. Okay, not not ours. Um, look at what he says here within these verses. Now, large crowds were, were gathering with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoa, what in the world? You know, that really throws some people off. Good morning, Pat. Been missing you. You know, that's been, that, throws a, that throws some people off, doesn't it? The idea that Jesus wants us to hate our family? Well, there's two things I want to say about this. First off, that idea he's talking about there in, in Matthew chapter 10, he has the same comments there.
But he says, if we do not love him more than our mother and our father. Jesus Christ is not telling us that we need to hate. In fact, that would go completely against the idea of 1 John, where we're supposed to love our brothers. Uh, if we don't love our brothers, how can we say we love God? The idea of hating others is not what a Christian is supposed to do. But in comparison to the way we feel about Jesus, we need to love him more. And if, if we, it comes between us and our family, it needs to be Jesus first. That's what Jesus is pointing out with those ideas. Good morning, Garam. That is what Jesus Christ is pointing out with those ideas. Um, we, must, we must love him more. Family itself cannot come between us and God. The blessing is God's word about how we care and take care of our family is, is a way. Yeah, Facebook is still working. No, it's not locked up. I'm seeing movement, Julie. Um, I'm uh, not seeing anything, so I'm going to refresh my screen. Okay. All right. No, I'm, I'm seeing movement on here. Um, people coming on and stuff. So, what was I saying? Okay. So, our 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 attitude towards towards Jesus needs to be whatever it takes to follow him, even to the point of our family. Now, as I was saying, God's word makes it clear how we're supposed to care for our family. We're supposed to love our family. We're supposed to, in various places, Ephesians chapter 5, we're supposed to love our wives. But even when it comes down to that relationship, God must come first. If a family member says, it's either me or your religion, which one's it going to be? Well, I hate that, man. I had to make that decision. But if those are the only two choices you're giving me, I'm following God. That's what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Now, that may sound cruel, but understand something. Jesus Christ doesn't want us to be, to be, uh, to be uh, not loved and love, loving towards our family. But Jesus Christ, in, even in loving our family, need to, need to recognize that loving him needs to come first. That's a discipline. That certainly is a discipline. You know, you will see a lot of people who, are, for instance, are on a, on a discipline, an exercising discipline. And what they want to do to get their body in shape. Well, they're told, well, you're going to have to sacrifice a couple things because this is how much time you have to spend on getting your body in shape. Uh, high school football players, whenever they're, whenever they're getting ready for the season. And uh, what does their coach have them doing? Spending almost every day of the week playing football. What about all the other fun things they like to do? Well, you've got to make a choice. Well, I'm not telling you you can't do any of those things. But what needs to come first during the during our practice season is practicing. All the other stuff comes second. So if you want to be in the band, or if you want to if you want to spend every night with your friends, you don't need to be on my football team. Now see see how that we understand how that works in everyday other things that we want to be we want to be involved in. But with God's church, with God's kingdom, his 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 following, God is saying the same thing that our college football, our high school football coaches have been saying for decades about football. All right. Well, a person has to have that discipline in order to be on God's team. Yes, ma'am. It reminds me a lot of Jake, my son Jake, when he was on the wrestling team. Um, when he wrestled, it was during the Thanksgiving Christmas season. And he had to maintain his weight. When he got on that scale, he had to weigh exactly. And he did not eat. He, he drank minimally and he ate minimally to get on that scale. All the luscious foods all around him that whole season. And he denied himself yeah. in order to uh, meet the requirement of the coach. Yeah. And so I, I see that you know, as a parallel. We, have, we are crucified with Christ. Um, our self and, and our desires are sacrificed yeah. to please our God. Amen. That, that, as an excellent, and I love the fact you said crucify. I don't know if you did that on purpose because of the next verse, but as an excellent, excellent lead into the next verse. But so let me draw on that here in a second. But notice, notice what she was saying. Her son, in order to be in his weight class, to be able to be able to help his team for his weight class, which he was right on the verge of going up to the next one, he had to 
Forgo Thanksgiving dinner? Christmas. And Christmas dinner? But I'm thinking Thanksgiving especially. I, I really like all the stuff at Thanksgiving. Christmas can be really good, but I'm normally thinking presents on Christmas Day. But Thanksgiving is you go and eat as much as you can, and then you go in and watch football and fall asleep on the couch. That's Thanksgiving, all right? Because you stuffed yourself. But he had to forego that. Well, what a mean thing for the coach to do. It all it all dealt down to how important is it for you to be on the team. Excellent example, okay? And we'll do that. We'll do that for lots of things. How important is it for you to be on Christ's team? Now, again, that doesn't mean that every Christian has to have a horrible relationship with his or her family. What it does mean is every Christian needs to have a better relationship with his God. That's all it means, okay? Look at verse, look at verse uh, 27, because Jesus recognizes what he was asking. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, he uses that word cross. Remember, this is before Jesus Christ was nailed to one. But he's, he's making a point that he knew they were going to get even better after he died. But in their day, they knew what a cross was. A cross was something you carried to the place you're going to be executed. And so he uses that phrase, carry your own cross, all right? And he says, he, he understands exactly what he's saying. Because look at his next words. Um, For which of one of you, I'm sorry, that, I'm thinking of Matthew's account. Matthew's account goes on to say, whoever will gain his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will gain it. That's in Matthew chapter 10. That, that idea of the cross. Like Julie mentioned, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I die to self, become Christ's disciple. Okay, that needs to be the discipline. I have a wonderful life. There are lots of things I have in life that I enjoy. God has given me lots of things in life to enjoy. But all of it belongs to him. And all of it needs to be, I need to be ready. And that's not an easy thing to say. But I need to be ready to sacrifice it, if necessary, to follow him. Okay? What happens if tomorrow the government says, you know, if you continue worshiping God, we are going to fine you $1,000 a day. What do you do? There's a question. You know, that's a question we need to answer before time. What do you do? You know, um, I can't afford $1,000 a day. What do you do? Christians have had to... Get get, on jail clothes. What's that? Get ready to put on prison get on clothes. Ready to, yeah, yeah, get, yeah, get ready to put on prison clothes and, and start a prison ministry. That's right. You know, you know, what do you do? But what do you do? All of it comes down to what's most important to you. Look at now, now look at the very next thing. And, and God makes, and this is that point I'm trying to say. When do you decide to do that? When do you decide necessary? Don't wait to make that decision to the day that it's it's required of you. Decide now. When do you what do you do when that comes? Look at the very next thing he says. For which verse 28. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and cal calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. You know, there's a uh, uh, there's a uh, an ark down in in Kentucky that I visited. Wonderful thing to go see. But you know, that's not the first time that someone tried to gotcha. You know, that's not the first time that someone tried to uh, build uh, an ark. If you go in Maryland and travel on I sixty eight down I sixty eight, you're going to see a sign that says the ark is being rebuilt here. And it's a bunch of girders, and it's been there for decades. They didn't count the cost. They just assumed they were, they, by faith, they assumed they were going to be able to get there. <laughs> well, their faith was lacking, obviously, because they did not get there. They were not able to do it. They didn't, they didn't, they should have counted the cost. They should have gotten themselves more involved or know that they could do it. Look what he goes on to say. 
Let me read that again. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to, com to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, is not able to finish, all who observe it will ridicule him. Well, I was just ridiculing them, wasn't I? You know, because it's not going to get finished. I don't even know if that church is still there. Um, but if, it, if they are, if I was them, I'd tear that down. It's, it's a total ridicule itself of their lack of finishing something that they started. Now that the one is, is done in, in Kentucky, why, why build it? Just go visit that one. Take people to that one. But, but the idea of, of leaving it there just shows that you didn't count the cost. Maybe they use it as a good example of talking about what it says here. Maybe that's why they leave it there, to remind themselves. I have no clue. But, but um, um, yeah, verse 30 just goes on to say, say the same thing. Um, now, verse 31 is an interesting point. Let me finish with that. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Okay, that, you know, you got to make certain. Now, you got you got a city, you got walls, 20,000 might be coming up against you. Can you defend your city? What if you decide you can't defend your city? What if you decide that there's no way you're going to be able to win against this other king coming against you? Look at what he goes on to say. Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his possessions. Jesus Christ says, here's my terms of peace. He's the king with 20,000 coming up against you with 10,000. Do you realize that about that illustration? Jesus Christ is talking about himself. He says, I'm coming up against you. You're not going to win this battle. There's going to be a judgment day one day. You've got a decision to make. You want to sue me for peace? Here's what the cost is of being my disciple. None of you who can be my disciple who does not give up all his possessions. Now, mind you, Jesus Christ, his disciples had things. They owned things. Just before Jesus Christ uh, dies on the cross, he tells his disciples, you know, I'm sending you out. Get yourself a cloak. Get yourself sandals. They're going to have possessions. He's not saying you can't have things. Okay? But what he is saying is that we need to be ready to lose those if necessary. We need to recognize that they belong to God now. Our lives need to be totally devoted to Christ, no matter what the cost that's called the cost of discipleship. Disciple is a very important word in God's Bible. And it's one that we need to get our heads straight on right now, before it gets bad, if it ever does. Maybe it'll never get bad. But what will you do if it does get bad? Decide now. Later on, the temptation will be decide will to be decide to give up. Decide now what you will do. What is your soul worth to you now? If you're thinking rationally, eternity versus uh, life on this earth for what? At best, 90, 100 years, 110. They say you're really blessed. 110 years. Um, what is your life on this earth worth? Is it worth more than eternity with Jesus Christ? That's the battle that we're in. We've got to decide whether we're going to sue for peace. And Jesus Christ makes no bones about it. John chapter 14, verse 6. No one comes to the Father except by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me, through me. That's the terms of peace. Come to Christ. Do his will. Follow him. He is king. Verse 18 of Matthew 28 again. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Recognize him as king and follow him as king. Thank you all very much. Um, any other comments on the word disciple?
one who follows a teaching, a discipline. I love that word discipline. We must discipline our lives to follow Christ. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, this opportunity we've had to study your word. Please help us, Father, to recognize what your word is saying, to recognize, Father, what it means to be a disciple, and to decide right now, Father, before there's the bad times, if there's going to be bad times come, over being your disciple. What will we do? What are we willing to face as your disciples? How far are we willing to go? How much is eternity worth to us? Father, we love you, we trust you, and we do give ourselves over to you. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen.